Welcome to STARS Podcast, your growth mindset mecca. We are all about self-leadership principles here at STARS Podcast. Our guests come from all over the world with very unique stories of how they hack their way into success. As you'll quickly find out, nothing happens overnight. And as always, enjoy the journey. Hey everybody, welcome back. For all you longtime listeners, thank you for returning. For all you new time listeners, welcome to the fam. Today we have a special guest coming onto the show, Sami from The Fives NFT. It is a play to earn mobile game that is a little bit of a riff off of those of you who are retro gamers, uh, NBA Jam. You know, the he's really heating up that one. Yeah, that's the one that they're kind of riffing off of. And, uh, He's worked in places like Salesforce, Flexport, Expo. He's been part of uh, public API teams. He's created NFT marketplaces uh, for big names like TikTok and uh, has done a lot in the startup world. And now his efforts are pointed into the play to earn NFT world. So enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome back. This is Ron Jordan coming at you at Rosinante Studios in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. What you're listening to today is Stars Podcast, the growth mindset mecca. Today we have Sammy coming in to us uh, from Fives NFT, which is a mobile play to earn. It's a, uh, those of you who are not familiar with NFTs and play to earn, um, anybody who has played any video games and has, you know, purchased in, inside of your Bejeweled game, you purchase more gems or those, uh, those in-app purchases. You're talking play to earn on that. Um, so we're monetizing those types of things and that type of behavior. So, Sammy, welcome to the show. And uh, I can't wait to get into Fives NFT and what that's all about and uh, what your mindset is behind creating something like that. So welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, for sure. So, Sammy, where does Sammy come from? What, what's Why should people believe in Sammy on the Fives NFT? What's up? Um, That's a great question. Uh, I think so generally, I think projects right now, uh, that you see like a lot of anonymous founders and I think that's not necessarily like a bad thing. I think we're going to see that rise and like, that's going to become popular and more viable. I would say one of the cool things about our project is like from day one, we've been pretty transparent about who me and Tristan are. Um, like our backgrounds are both like we're engineers. I come from like the startup world. I worked at a few startups. Tristan's been like a game developer and been like a ro autonomous robotics champion before. And so both have like pretty diverse technical backgrounds. So we have kind of experience in like how to build companies, how to like actually build products. And I think that's something that's very rare in the, uh, in the NFT world, most, mostly they're run by marketing people. So that's kind of like our, our work background, but I would say generally like outside of just skill set, I think us being transparent about who we are, like there's some risk on the line when you say like, hey, I'm running this project and that you can't really screw people over or if you can, like that's tied to your reputation. So uh, I think those are kind of like the, the few things that people like about us and our community. Like one is again, we have like product experience building things and two is like, we're very transparent about who we are, what we're, what our objective is here. Absolutely. So you said you have um, a, a history of, of building things. What are some of the things that you have built? Yeah. Uh, so at previous companies, like I used to work at uh, Salesforce and Flexport and Expo. So Salesforce, like hundred billion dollar company, I worked on open source uh, distributed um, distributed systems libraries there. And then at Flexport, I worked on their public API team. And then I personally have actually built like a few other companies, like a voice chat uh, app that I sold to startups, and I built an NFT marketplace for TikTok stars. This was actually before. Uh, TikTok launched it a few months before that. And so while I was working on that is how I actually met Tristan. And Tristan's like, again, been like a game developer, worked on a few games. He's um, worked, he has worked on um, like training autonomous robotics algorithms. And then he's done like some solidity con contracting with people. So that's kind of our background. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, I can definitely say from knowing tons of other projects that that is a pedigree that most do not boast. So I applaud you guys for that uh, and having that engineering background and being able to build things inside of the, uh, the technology that we're using. I think that's a huge leg up. Now, whenever you're talking about uh, the video game aspect and the play to earn aspect, I guess for my listeners, I'd, I'd like them to understand 
I think most of them get video games. I think we can all mm-hmm. all agree on video games. Um, right. The Fair play enough. to the play to earn part to me is still a little bit gray, and I'm trying to understand outside of are you going to have your own tokenomics? Is is that something that you're working on? Kind of run me through what the play to earn means and how you're going to execute on that. Yeah. Um, so I think generally what play to earn means to me, so again, broad definition, is that people can get some something back for their time they're investing in a game. And so how games normally work is that um, you might spend a lot of time and you might invest and you might earn these rare items in game or level up. And basically all you get is like status in this world, this virtual world. And so there's, there's been like marketplaces where you can like, let's say World of Warcraft or RuneScape, these games where you can basically take money from the game and like sell it to somebody else for real money. This is always kind of like a, a jank process. And so yep. you could technically like sell your money for real money, but it wasn't really like the, the native way. I think that the example people give a lot is like CSGO knife skins, right? Where you could like, there's like a thriving marketplace of this, but Steam kind of took like huge fees on these transactions. And so... Um, I think that the cool innovation with play to earn is that it's trying to make more games where when you invest time uh, into playing these games that you can actually, you're actually getting something out of it. And so for us, it happens to be that um, you're earning like rare in-game items or, or characters, and those basically can be either used by you or sold to other players. And so uh, that, that's kind of like what, what drives the uh, economy. Uh, and then you, you were mentioning, like, are we designing our own technomics? Are we designing our economy? Uh, yes, I think based every every play to earn game, anyone who has a token, whether they realize it or not, they are designing a, a, a micro economy. And so uh, that is a very part, important part of your job as anyone who has a token. And, if, and uh, you actually should not try and outsource this or try and run away from the importance or complexity of this task because your economy is basically your product. And so uh, designing the incentive structure of your economy to make sure that um, you're getting the correct behavior from actors, such as like players or investors in the network is extremely important. So uh, yeah, we, we think about that a lot. I'm, I ha- that's like fairly, uh, there's a lot of things involved in our economy. So like, I'm happy to talk about it more, but that's like the quick answer to your question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I totally get that. And so my, I've always thought about these play to earn games and the rare skins that you get and like, the grind that it takes to get your game kind of started to a point where you're like, Oh my God, now it's fun again. Cause right. they're not fun again, but now it's fun because I have all of the attributes that I need to progress quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I always see this as like, you know, everybody who was playing call of duty and they would prestige their weapons a bunch of times. I yeah. think about being able to sell those prestiged weapons and all of those skins to somebody else. Right. As a, as a package. And, because that's a that's playing to earn you know you're you're playing to earn those attributes and then you can then in turn sell it my question is always like can i sell it outside of your ecosystem and that's always where i'm like play to earn is good inside of your ecosystem but what does it mean for anybody outside of it Mm mm-hmm like, can you, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Do you mean, can you just sell it or can you use the items outside of the game? Can you sell it? Like, how do I even say it? Like you, the only way to actually gain an income from a play to earn game is somebody buying you out and then you getting actual either USD or um, Ethereum or, or whatever the case may be, whatever platform you're on, and then they can yeah. cash out through a marketplace or through a uh, an exchange. Yeah. Um. So with your token, is it possible for you to cash out to uh, an exchange? Yeah. So this is kind of the quote unquote magic of of the blockchain and building on um a, a chain like Ethereum where you have this huge ecosystem and global liquidity of any asset that's on this chain, right? So uh, let's use like the Call of Duty example you said. If there were to be, there's actually nothing stopping Call of Duty from saying, hey, let's make this marketplace you're talking about, or let's let you people sell 
like actually a good example is like maybe Diablo. I don't know if you've heard of this game. Diablo mm-hmm. actually had this marketplace in game where you could basically like earn rare items and then you could sell um, items to other players in their marketplace for either money or, uh, or like coins. And so um, I, there's, there's nothing stopping that from happening, but I think it was hard to like get exit liquidity, but and obviously also then you're locked into Diablo's servers and eventually they basically closed this marketplace down. And so at that point you couldn't sell anymore. And so that's kind of a, a weird experience the, again, the magic of like building on Ethereum or having an asset that lives on any, any like global blockchain or any blockchain that's like fairly decentralized is that um, that asset is now self owned and custodied by you, the user. And so um, I could shut down the game servers for fives and then you still own all your items on the blockchain, right? And so you can sell, you can still sell those anywhere you want. Like any, any um, like NFT marketplace will work, like OpenSea, Looks Rare, Genie, any of these places, you can sell it there. Um, anyone can buy it and anyone can read the data from these items. And so that like, I would say control and liquidity is a huge advantage that you have over any other, uh, like any, like the existing solutions. I think like an interesting point or like nuance there is, okay, if I shut down my game servers though, you, like you might, you have this asset, right? That lives on the But you can't use it. But yeah, exactly. So um, you, well, you can use it, but where can I use it? And so like our game, and basically every other game like has obviously special ways to interpret this this asset to say like okay your player for example has these stats and and etc and so even though uh, if our server were to shut down like the game were to shut down since everybody still has their assets and if people really liked the game someone could some new person could actually say hey we're making the exact same game we're respecting all the same stats anyone can now plug in their the th- that the assets that they owned into our game and it is going to work the exact same way. Uh, and so it's kind of a weird situation to think about because you're like, wait, wait, why would like the original company like shut down a game that, that people like? But um, I think it's it's probably more close to an analogous to something like patch updates or social networks that kind of like change their algorithms where um, the, the, there's a famous story of like Vitalik, he has uh, like some siphon, uh, I think siphon life spell in, in World of Warcraft got nerfed and then he got, he got pissed or something. And so um, you could imagine like if someone, if, if a group of people doesn't like certain updates to a game, maybe we make a, some bad updates to the game rather than shutting it down. There's nothing stopping anyone else from saying, hey, we want to make different updates or we want to have a different version of the game. Or we want to add this mod in and you, we respect the same in-game assets. And so what the, the benefit of this is, to the user, you have much more portability about who you want to go to, what type of game you want to use. You're not reliant on um, like again, our game servers storing all your assets. You're not beholden to us. And so it gives you more flexibility. It doesn't solve the problem immediately. Like I can't, you can't bring your like, your uh, we call them ballers or your characters, your baller into Call of Duty for now. But um, that's not to say that you never could do, do that. And I think that the main benefit is basically like optionality and control for you, where if these negative circumstances were to arise, then you have more control. The community has more control about how to deal with it. Would it be something of uh, of interest to have the actual users own the server itself? Is that a possibility, like where they could own the server itself so it wouldn't ever shut down? Um, how would that work? Really, that's a that's a really interesting question. Uh, yeah, I, no one's ever asked that asked that before. Uh, I think, I mean, logistically, how that would work is that you have to, I guess, run the like if you if you basically say the DAO, like the fives, not the company, the DAO pays mm-hmm. for like your hosting, for example. Then you could say like some budget gets approved every month, for example, for hosting. And that uh, maybe the token holders could vote on, okay, do we want to approve this budget? And so then um, effectively the community owns this thing. Uh, then you, you obviously have the governance question of like, okay, who owns your governance token right now? It's going to be mostly us. And so mm-hmm. like that, that's kind of more of like a syntactic sugar rather than like actually decentralized control. Um, but again, over time, I think mo- mo- over time networks, will, every network will become increasingly decentralized, right? And so you kind of have to start a network more centralized just because that's the nature of like yeah, creating something new. 
But then let's say in two, three years that um, maybe we have like, I don't know, maybe 10, just 10% of the tokens, in which case then it's kind of like community effort in terms of uh, who owns the resources. Again, still practically you need like, if someone votes for this, someone needs to do it, right? There needs to be like some engineer who like clicks create, create cluster. And so that person, whether they're voted by the community, whether they're hired by us, to be decided, but at, like you can't, you basically can't eliminate all trust. At some point, you need to like some person has to do something. Of course. Um, but uh, that's, I think that's like a, a pretty good model and pretty interesting thought experiment about like, okay, how can you be robust against like a few bad actors? Yeah. And, and because I always think about, you know, these people who end up buying all of these NFTs and have invested a ton of time into the game. And if you guys wanted to, you know, branch off and do something else and not, have the game like how do you transition the game to the community so you can go on to other things i'm always curious about that um because obviously people are going to be spending time and money on the game um yeah. and if even if i know people who play a, a game for 10 years at a time <laughs> you know so if you guys don't want to be strapped in for that long how do you transition uh to actually be decentralized and have the the community take it over um just some food for thought yeah uh, no, it's it's a, actually a very interesting experiment. I think like you could imagine like let's let's take it, examples where this happens right now. Like a lot of Blizzard titles, right? Probably World of Warcraft right now is not getting any love because basically just Blizzard got has gotten eaten like multiple times. Right? Like like Blizzard got bought by Activision. There was already a huge uproar about like okay, their innovation has stopped. This company is basically dead. Now Microsoft buys that company, so it's like all right, how much more corporate corporate bloat are you going to get? You could imagine like. There's there's probably like a pretty strong like World of Warcraft or Diablo like core group that would want to say like hey no we want to like run the, some version of this game ourselves mm -hmm. um, whether they can afford the IP that's another question but let's say they can um, I think the way it would work is just basically the governance token model I I, I outlined there right so um, in in some the like the IP that our company owns is would be I guess like fairly limited probably just like source code of the like server side of the game and then um, maybe like three D art assets and so basically if we start if we like start selling more of our portion of the token to the community then the community owns that and then um, we could like hold some election for um, top community members to basically run the the source code I right. think that is like this, it's an interesting question of like, what is going to be open source in this world versus like what is going to yep. be closed source? Uh, because yeah, so what ends up becoming your proprietary source code and what right. is available for public? Because right. obviously there's going to be some that you want to keep close to the chest, and then others that yeah, you're totally open source, whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, I think so. If, I mean, the, the obvious one is that that's open source is like any any on chain contracts, right? So and anyone can check that out and, sh and yep. should audit those, and um, those are all public, and that's good because again, this is kind of how you get these magical features of like, okay, I can sell my thing on OpenSea or wherever I want. Um, us personally, right now, the like game source code on our server that we're writing is is closed source, and then our art assets uh, are closed source. Like we have fully three D models that are that are rigged. Um, I imagine that there's going to be, I don't, honestly don't have a great answer for how, like how we would move that to a decentralized world. And if we, if we want to continue ma maintaining the game, because, um, there's a, especially with the fact that assets are held, held decentralized. Um, if you open source your game code, then basically any competitor could say like, okay, we're just going to fork your thing and like right. start developing on top of it. Uh, the thing we really want to encourage um, actually the opposite of that is that we want people to build other game modes that are not like our game or build mods on top of our game where you can use the same assets. And so um, I think probably the first thing we're going to open source is like SDKs or ways to basically build on top of the game as opposed to the core game code. Okay. Um, but I'm actually, I'm interested to see how this evolves because this is kind of like the model and every game is following right now. Uh, I would I would love to see if there's like a good model for like an open source, uh, fully open source code based game because you could imagine like the the mod community or like the developer network effects you could get if you had a fully open source like interoperable game code would be immense and so um, 
I, I don't have a good answer for it right now, but if, if there's like g- games that you've thought of that you think have done this well or like are thinking about it, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know any off the top of my head, but what I did think about as soon as you said what you did there about making some of it uh, open source and the derivative that could come out of it mm-hmm. um, would be a lot of fun. You know, th- I think about Madden back in the day where um, we were able to like make the heads bigger or make the bodies huge or, yeah. or like, change, change weird stuff or you know, even somebody who wants to create their own, um, I could think of whenever you're talking about ballers here and I could see somebody wanting to create like a, uh, their, their NFT team. Mm-hmm. And that's the Jersey. Like that's what they, they would want to have their team be their, um, gunner cat gang or V friends or, or board ape or whatever, you know, yeah. like they could do that as a Jersey. And then that's sort of the derivative of, of your game. So that's, yeah, that's a lot sure. of fun. Yeah, no, I think so that we are aiming to do um, because I think there's basically pieces of the game that you can uh, plug in that are easier to do uh, than others. So, for example, like even even easier than that is we can we're going to very soon let like independent 3D artists make basically custom clothing for characters because that right now we have like one character build type. It's fully rigged. And so if uh-huh. you just basically know that build type you can design any clothing and it will automatically get rigged to the character and they can do all their normal animations. It's a little bit harder to say, okay, let's make maybe a slightly different base model for them, like a gutter cat or a board ape. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's like definitely on the roadmap very soon where we want people to bring, be able to bring in their other avatars uh, and then be able to use them in the world. I don't, it's not, it's not too much extra work, but um, it is like, a, it's a little bit more. And so those, those are the types of tools that we want to make it easy for people to do. I think where it gets a little bit harder is like core core game mods or uh, or like building um, some sandbox um, new type of game modes with these. Yeah. And so that's where like I look at companies probably like Roblox is one of the best at doing this where their their game is like really like mostly a platform, not really a game where it's like mostly the community basically building efforts. Yeah. GTA mod modders are like very, very sophisticated at this point. Uh, and so I, I, that, again, that community, like we care a lot about, and I think that's really how you make like in this decentralized world, how you make yeah. a game that lasts and have like, um, you spark the creativity of the community, right? Like we only have only so many good ideas. And so I, my prediction is yes. basically like our, my prediction actually is like in the long term, our game mode is going to be like the most lame game of like of yeah. all the community <laughs> games. And basically all we did was like kickstart it prove hey there's like something fun you can make with this and then we have like a really kick-ass platform and then basically the community is making all the better games for sure so let me ask you what what would somebody do or how does somebody get involved in in this kind of this ecosystem of becoming an engineer of sorts like where would you point somebody who would want to from scratch doesn't have any education whatsoever like where where would you point somebody to want to become part of that community with you guys not just the game but like the development side yeah um which part of the development so there's i guess let me let me clarify the question so there's um multiple things we do technically there's like blockchain engineering there's just general software engineering there's game development and then there's art uh so those are all like a sort a different type of development so is there a specific uh one you're talking about or all of them well, if we went through all of them, that's that's too that's too many verticals. Um, how about just like the actual programming of the game? If they wanted to get into modding games, where where would you point somebody to start? Um, so yeah, game programming is kind of like so. Uh, this, I guess another follow up question: uh, Are you assuming no programming background or like or some programming background? Let's say that they they have no programming background whatsoever. Okay. Um, then I would say the best so if you go there there's our game is built in unity so there's a few like main game engines basically um unity and unreal are kind of like the most popular ones for indie developers uh unity is like typically considered unity is like a little bit easier to use smaller teams use it it's like you can have less maximum graphics um and it's like usually more people know unity because again more approachable unreal is kind of more for like bigger triple a games bigger teams use it um and what so, does triple a game mean triple a game is like halo or like gears of war or like world of warcraft where that's like 
big investment budget, very big team, more like more than like 50 people working on this thing. Like I love Gears of War. Yeah, I don't know why I thought of that one. That's like a hella throwback reference. I know. I was like uh, <laughs> back in the day sniping people from like uh, the uh, I remember the stairs, the ruins, I think it was like you were such a disadvantage if you were the team at the bottom trying to go up the stairs. Yeah. In the little graveyard area. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For I sure. digress. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I realized also my three references were like extremely old. Maybe like, I don't know, what's a better new reference? Uh, like, Is it like Fortnite? Like the new God of like War. That? Sorry? Fortnite, God of War, Final yeah, Fantasy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Basically, it's just game. I would say, it, there's, I don't know, I think there's some technical definition, but the, like the unofficial definition is basically if there's like a large game studio with like large team and large budget and it has like like very compelling graphics or end gameplay that that is like kind of, bigger scope than what a smaller team might be able to do understood um anyway so yeah we were saying that um yeah unreal so unreal is kind of like again this is oversimplified there's like many game engines a lot of com- a lot of companies that make these triple a games actually they just have their own game engine so this is oversimplified but like if you're new i would say look at unreal and unity i would personally say you should look at unity first it's a little bit easier and more approachable uh and so you actually don't need to know like programming to start because they they basically have tooling to do I, so i would i would personally go on youtube and just look up like basic unity tutorial and like try and figure out some play concept you you want to do don't don't try and make a serious game you're going to get like just, so this is just a general like learning strategy if you're if, if approaching a new area don't focus on like oh i'm like very serious about this kind of just be like i'm i'm optimized for learning right now let me experiment right. more and so Draw some stick figures first Exactly, exactly. So in yeah. Unity, there's like, um, it, and a lot of game engines, you can basically drag between, it's you, it's, you can kind of do like programming logic with with uh, UI. And so you don't strictly need to know how to program. Uh, so I would just watch a video, like not, maybe not even, don't even come up with your own concept, just watch a tutorial on, on, on YouTube about what make a simple game that'll kind of introduce it to you. There's a lot of complexity to these tools. So like, you're gonna constantly be learning. Uh, I think if you're like want to become more serious about it, you probably should learn just general like programming and logic because that's going to help you um, both with like debugging things, making more advanced games, thinking through things like in a logical manner. So those that's where I would suggest to start. But um, there's a there's like a, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Absolutely. Why ballers? Like why basketball? Like what is What's that about? Um, great question. So originally, I'm I'm a big basketball fan. Tristan's a big basketball fan. Um, I played. You mentioned Madden. I played like hundreds and hundreds of hours of 2K and Madden when I was a kid, and I always felt like the sports games were static year to year. Oh, uh, thank you. They were they were basically. So I I was like like very very into these things i was i ran like franchises i played against people online i was like a top one percent ranked player in all of these so like i was like very in depth about what was actually changing i was keeping track of the games and i just noticed there was just like a sports monopoly where there was no gameplay innovation happening there and um this is kind of like opposite of what happens in basically every every other genre like look at the shooter genre over the last decade we used to have like very very basic shooters now you have games like i don't know if you know like valorant or or like or even even Fortnite right now in the past few years, like Battle Royale and like the type of the type of innovations that have happened in, in shooter games is so much more. And like the gameplay style now is so different. If you look at like, if you look at someone playing Valorant and look at someone playing like Halo 2 or Halo 3, it's right. like, like comically different in terms of how much it's progressed. Um, however, if you look at someone playing NBA 2K22 and you look at someone playing like NBA 2K10, the same. <laughs> it's... It's like surprising how similar the game is. And in some ways that's like not their fault fully in the fact that they're trying to make like a simulation game and make it as realistic as possible. So you're like, you can't, you'd have like less degrees of freedom, but I always just thought the game felt very static. And I was upset that for people like me who are both like sports and gaming fans that there wasn't like, it didn't feel like there was any passion behind those things. It was just like a money printing machine where like basically it was a roster update you were paying $60 for every year. Yeah. And so uh, I just wanted to make like a game for that 
hybrid audience because I was that audience. And so like some, I know there's a lot of people who like sports, a lot of people who like video games, both. And then like, there's a lot of people who are like now interested in this new area of like, all right, technology, cryptocurrency, play to earn. Uh, so I think that's what inspired it. I think more from like a business perspective, basketball is now, I would say the most culturally relevant sport globally, more than soccer, more than football. Um, wow. And I think like, that's, that's, there's like a few reasons for this. Like basically basketball markets, their superstars, the best, like basketball shoe culture is so, is so relevant. And that's like, that's, that's penetrated the scenes like streetwear and hip hop is kind of like very tightly associated with basketball. And so it kind of has this like unfair advantages that the other sports don't have, where you can like very reasonably wear basketball stuff outside of a context versus like my, I'm not going to wear like my football cleats on, on like at, at the mall. Uh, so basketball is just extremely popular. Everyone basically knows about it and has some connection to it. And I think that is very important for a game, especially with a lot of new things going on. For example, the play to earn aspect, these like avatars that you have, you can like earn items. So the fact that there's something that you can tie it to that, you know, that's familiar that can, uh, that in, in addition to these new things, make it, makes it more approachable for, for new people entering. Uh, and I think people already have like some existing passion about basketball, right? Like if you want to spin up your own new IP, like let's say uh, like Axie basically made like a Pokemon rip, right? It's like you own these creatures and like they have to like try and bootstrap this new IP about care about this universe, care about these creatures. And so that it's like a little bit harder to do that. And I think it also appeals like for me personally, when I see those guys, like I don't, I don't want to own one. I don't think it looks cool. For yeah. me, if I see like a cool like basketball, like a like a cyborg basketball player type of guy, that looks cool to me. I just I feel like I resonate with that more easily, and so uh, I guess part of it is just like I feel like I understood that market, and, I, and that's something that I personally wanted. So it made more logical sense. Absolutely. So is your game not going to be so much a simulation of like playing basketball? Is it going to be like that's going to be a part of it, and then others is going to be a story mode that they're going through, or like kind of run me through what the game actually is going to be. And then I'd, yeah, let's do that. And then I do have another question about the actual NFT and the earnings. Yeah, for sure. Um, so generally in sports games, there's been, I guess the, there's zero innovation is like a little bit of a, of a comedic exaggeration. There's basically three types of sports games that usually that exist. So one is simulation games. So simulation game is like NBA 2K, Madden, FIFA. They try and make it as realistic as possible. Uh, in terms of graphics, in terms of gameplay, et cetera. On the opposite end is that there's like spreadsheet games or like general manager games. So they, these are uh, basically just spreadsheet games where you like own and manage a team and you never actually play. It's just fully um, simulated. And then in the middle, we have um, what's called like arcade style games. I don't know if you played like NBA Jam or, or games like that, where mm -hmm. it's kind of like stylized, cartoony, more casual and approachable, but it's like based in the real sport. And like, I would say Rocket League is kind of an example of this where like they took, they, they were a hybrid of like a sci-fi and like real life sports and, and combined into one thing. And so our game is aiming for that, that last one I mentioned, which is like, it's an arcade audience. Uh, rationale behind that is because uh, I think that's the most fun and approachable to play. I think it makes sense with like having sci-fi characters in like an arcade basketball game. Also from a competitive business perspective, um, I think the like spreadsheet games, it's very hard to differentiate yourself. And I think on the simulation games, I don't want to compete with like 2K or, or Madden. I think that's like that game already exists. Like if you want to beat 2K, we probably need like hundred million dollar budget. I think we could do it, but like I need a big budget. Yeah. Uh, and so we're making basically like an arcade style game. And so it's simplified controls, more stylized, like more like cool dunk practice, focus on kind of like the highlight cool parts of basketball. Don't mm -hmm. make it so um, ex like realistic, like 2K. So I would say the best analogy is kind of like an NBA jam type experience where you have like less players on the court, more like more extreme actions, like just focus on like the coolest parts of basketball. I really like that too. And what you talked about earlier is the amount of culture inside of the basketball uh, arena is, is interesting. Um, so with the NFT itself and you start earning some of these, uh, let's say you get, you know, like the, the rare basketball or some, you know, a rare Jersey and things like that. Um, or, or your team wins the championship. Let's, let's take it a step further. Is there any in real life capabilities uh, for redemption? like getting to meet 
you guys or or even going to games and things like that? Or is that something that you're thinking about as well for in real life as a in, in addition to uh, the play to earn side? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think if giving a reward to meet us would not be that exciting for most people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe to meet you and then go to a game or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think they'll be okay with just the Zoom call with us. They're like, I want to meet Steph, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is, it's a great point. Like one of the very unique things about our game compared to a lot of play to earn games is this like tie to real life. And so like, we're talking to a lot of athletes right now to basically set up sponsorships where they can sell like their own custom cosmetics in the game. And so I you literally can... just wrote down any collabs with other <laughs> I just wrote that down. <laughs> Yeah, so basically we're we're working with not only players but also like YouTubers, Twitch streamers, and because um, they can basically all all will have like their own custom collections where you can buy their clothing or their shoes and equip it to your character. And so um, the benefit of that, like the the unique feature of that, is that those have real life ties, right? Like it you it's less logical. I don't want, again. I don't want to like rag on Axie, but Axie is kind of the example everybody knows. Like it's kind of less logical to say, all right, let me get basketball shoes for my Axie character or like a jersey for my Axie versus in our game, like it's all, you're, it's a real person. So you can basically equip with real clothing to them. And so you could imagine like we can have streetwear merch drops where certain rare items, you also get a merch drop in, in real life. Or you could say, oh, for this, uh, this Twitch streamer or this um, YouTuber, if you buy their limited collection, they're also holding an event where you can go to this event or maybe... Uh, someone like Steph Curry goes off in like the finals. He has an insane game. And then we could release, oh, uh, this is like his special finals edition shoe. And if you get this, like, again, we'll uh, give you also this like finals uh, merchandise that, that comes with it. And so the benefit of like, uh, the way I view us is that we're, we're kind of like a bridge between the real world and the digital world. Because again, it's like, it's a basketball game. It has tied to reality and it has tied to the digital world. And so there's a lot of opportunities there with collabing with influencers, celebrities, athletes, doing merchandise drops. Um, this is, uh, there's just a few examples. I think there's so many more thought like ways you can do it in unique ways. Um, but it's, pr it's going to be very context dependent based on like, all right, who is the person? What is the, like, the what is there is like, what is the sports event happening? What's the real life dynamic happening? So I guess the, the short answer is yes, we're definitely going to do it. There's a lot of, things we could potentially do. So I don't want sure. to say one or the other, but uh, there's, there's a lot of things you can do in that area for sure. Yeah. And I think the options are endless too, because now that you're not actually like trying to mimic something that exists, your options are absolutely endless with the amount of collaborations you can do and the amount of teams you could create the amount of everything. Um, yeah. you, you don't put a cap on it by not trying to simulate something that already exists and creating your own thing. And I think that's monumental. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like, um, you, again, I think one of the cool things is that for you can have different things that you get in the game and different things that you get in real life. And so I bring up like the Valorant example and Valorant, there's this like skin where your, your gun is like a dragon. And, uh, I, I always thought that was like a good example for what can have happen in like cosmetics in game items where your shoes don't have to actually be functional shoes, right? You could have like a, just a dragon on your on your character's feet. And then right. maybe with the real life shoe you get, obviously it has to like exist. Incorporate it somehow, yeah. Yeah, incorporate it somehow. But um, I always thought that was like a really cool flexibility that we're going to have is that like, imagine like Nike, like LeBron signs a deal with Nike, or like Steph signs a deal with Under Armour. Like all of these athletes, all these celebrities are now going to move to signing digital merchandising deals with like gaming companies. And that's going to be really exciting because now they're going to be more empowered. They're going to have an ability to like get their name out and like, and, and capture more of the value they're creating. And they'll actually have more freedom in terms of like, what is the actual art going to be? What is this item that they can sell? And so that's, that's like another thing I'm, I'm super excited about. Digital asset deals. Yeah, I'm, for sure. I mean, that's to me in my head, it just like started spinning out because that makes total sense where, yeah, you're going to have your, your Nike in real life shoe deal, but at the same time, you're going to have your digital asset deals too, because of these play to earn games. That's really, man, that, that just threw me for a loop there. Cause it yeah, makes a I lot think, of sense. No, I, I think um, if you, it's going to be funny in about 10 years. So there's the order, this dynamic that exists where um, the, the best players like, Le, like LeBron and Steph, 
they don't make most of their money from their salary, right? They make most of their money from sponsorships and merchandise. And so um, what's going to happen now is that actually, I think the third, that there's going to be a third thing added there, a di digital merchandising, and that's going to actually be the biggest source of their income and revenue. Yeah. And the reason that's going to happen is because um, the physical merchandise has this property where you have to actually like make something, right? I have to make a shoe if I want to sell the shoe. And so there's like some baseline cost. I have to have a factory. I have to ship it somewhere. And like, if I make money on this shoe, it's basically a margin, right? Like, let's say it costs $5 to make it sell for hundred dollars. Cool. I made like $95 on this thing. The cool, there's a cool property of like anything digital, which is like, if I make something once I can make it an art piece of art one time. And now I can sell it infinite number of times. And like, I don't, I'm not manufacturing anything. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, and I can sell it globally instantly. Yeah. And so that is, imagine like the liquidity or like the amount of, um, like commerce or opportunity that now you can have where anyone in the entire world can buy your shoe instantly. And uh, you have so much more, some, so many more degrees of freedom on your, uh, on like creativity or what this thing is going to actually look like or do. And so that's now opens up the door. And I feel like it's going in, in five to 10 years from now, the biggest athletes, the vast majority of their income is going to come from like digital asset deals. And that's probably how we're going to see, like people talk about creator economy or talk about like, rise of like individual celebrities. Uh, that's how we, I would say we're going to see the vast majority of these people come become like billionaires, people like Steph, et cetera, who have so much influence. They're going to become billionaires from selling digital assets and, and games and, and, and social networks, I imagine. And it allows for really unique opportunities to make changes from, because like a shoe now, it takes X amount of time to make the actual shoe. Mm -hmm. And if somebody doesn't like it, then it's going to take so much long. It's going to take a long time to replicate and make a change to that shoe. But with digital assets, I mean, you can do it instantaneously, which can be good and it can be bad. So, right. you know, but it allows the community input very quickly and you can make adjustments. And I think that's a really unique perspective on uh, digital assets themselves. So. I could go on and on about this game, but I want to know a little bit more about you too, Sammy. And I want to understand like, so with these big goals that you have in mind, uh, the ethos at stars podcast is all about self-leadership and being able to have a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Obviously you have a growth mindset because you're trying to evolve a different type of game where like, what do you do on a, on a daily basis as far as habits go to keep your kind of keep your mental health, in, in check and make sure that you can continue to strive towards these big goals? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that. Um, I think for me, honestly, it's about working on something that I care about is where, I, where you have to start. So I was working at like pretty legit companies in like Silicon Valley. These are like some of the top, like uh, some of the top startups. I was like making a good amount of money there. The reason I, I, I quit my job before I had this idea before I, I went through like five failed startup ideas before getting to fives. And the reason I quit was because I just found like when I was waking up every day, I was very unhappy with what I was spending my time on. I felt like I was not um, working on something that I felt like was deeply meaningful in terms of just like literally what the work I was doing every day and or long-term growth where I wanted to go in my life, what change I wanted to see in the world. Uh, and so I think the number one thing is like, think about what you care about and then try and align how you're spending your time to move towards that goal. And uh, I've, I've noticed just like, there's a lot of things you can do on a daily basis in terms of like, all right, uh, uh, like productivity hacks or like morning routines or anything like this. I found I'm honestly the most productive, not when I'm trying to like optimize those, but just when I feel like I genuinely care about what I'm doing. So for me, like me and Tristan will spend like a lot of days. This sounds like terrible to some other people. A lot of days we'll be like working till two or 3 AM, like just from, from when we start in the morning and like work is kind of a subjective term, right? And in, in some ways I'm working all day, in some ways, like, hey, I'm making a video game and I play video games during the day to like study what, what to make. And yeah. so am I working all day or am, I, or am I working zero hours? It's kind of unclear there. Uh, so I would say that's, that's like the general thought I have. And in, ter in terms of my personal happiness, I just find like I care about making a project that 
uh, I, I guess like zooming out, like what's the goal of our project? I, I, for me, I noticed all these blockchain games were like very, very badly designed for like, I, as a gamer, I noticed that, that the games weren't fun. A lot of people think they're like scams because they're like kind of Ponzi nomics, questionable economics. And then I felt like they weren't, they didn't have like good user experience. Like, like I couldn't give this to like my friend or, my, or who wasn't in crypto and say like, hey, start playing this. All of those things kind of like irked me as a, as a gamer. I, I, I found like, hey, this is a really cool technology. I want to put this in the hands of a lot of people. I want people to see this as cool as I see it. And then similarly, like the, the two, like the sports gaming thing from my past, I was still kind of had that as like an annoyance in my head. So I, we kind of just wanted to make a game that um, brought like the next billion people into like Web3 and under and give show them in an approachable way why this is cool, why it's not a scam. Hey, games can actually be fun. Hey, this can help you. You can learn while doing this. And so that's kind of what motivates me generally and what makes me excited about building it. And I feel like whenever I think about that, that's kind of what like gets me excited to, to work more on it. I don't know if that answered your question or, or that was just rambling. No, no, it answers the question. It's just, it's about finding the happiness and finding uh, some sort of, um, oh, what's the word for it? Like not a, it is a passion project. It's because you're driven to, uh, you know, share your experience and share kind of the, you want the customer experience to be optimal inside of your game. And you being a gamer gives you that unique experience as well as, you know, an engineer and having all of these, um, these accolades under your belt is really, really unique. I mean, honestly, and then to then go a next step and say, Hey, you know, we're, you've thought it out so much that you're like, I don't want to compete with, you know, what's already existing. I want to be, I want the creativity to have endless streams. And so you, now you're going into like this sci-fi, you know, web three and really leaning into it. And I think that's where you're finding that, um, that validation is, is like, you know, you're, you're creating something that is going to allow you to grow as well as grow your community and still have these awesome cultural ties, which I think is really important to you. Yeah, I think um, gaming in general, if, if you ask my mom, she would have thought at the time it was completely useless endeavor. Of course. But in, in retrospect, uh, it's it's funny. I feel like I have to thank gaming a lot for me getting into technology, learning about the world, like sparking that curiosity, sparking a lot of my skills. The, the way I learned to type literally was because I wanted to play RuneScape and like I learned to type and like sell things on that game. And so that kind of like that I hopped from game to game learning like new app. The way I learned to throw a football, the way I learned to shoot a basketball was playing the game. Like my, like my parents are both immigrants. They didn't like play any of these sports. So like I became like a varsity athlete at these sports by literally watching people on video games play. And so for me, I felt like those had huge impacts on my life. And I wanted to kind of make a game that for, for like, who is the future Summy that's going to be playing this thing? What are, what are they going to think? And what, like, I want to make a game where they can learn like similar lessons or even more lessons that I learned. So that definitely is a part of it where I feel like these were like very impactful on me. And so I want to kind of make the next generation of that, given all the things I've learned over the years and like kind of try and package that into something better. Absolutely. And have I been butchering your name the whole time? Is it Sami? I've been it's calling Sami, you Sammy. Yes. Sami. Yes, perfect. All right. My my fault on that. Um, no worries. Yeah, absolutely. So you and Tristan are, are a team of two. Who? I mean, do you have a, a larger team at scale or is it just you guys really bootstrapping this thing and then relying on community to uh, to build out the sort of the the buzz around it? Like, what are you guys doing for for that side of it? Uh, so Tristan and I are the co-founders. Um, we actually have a pretty solid team size now. It's, it's I think, 10 people. Uh, we have like a few artists who are, who are contractors. So that's kind of like an elastic number. Um, but no, funnily enough, like the first em employees we hired were from the Discord community. And so this is going to be, I think, well, I mean, one, first of all, that's just fucking insane. Like, I like uh, I don't know. I think you talked to Fitzy and then, like, we mm -hmm. have another guy, Alpine. Um, they're, like, two just complete studs that we met online from the base. They minted our original NFT. They were, like, very active in the community. And then we, like, have brought them on board now as, like, as team members because they're just so passionate and they're so talented at what they do. And I think that is 
I mean, just the, like, let's zoom out. That's fucking insane, right? Like the fact that uh, we launched a project and that people found about it, out about it online and, ba and basically like wanted to collaborate and work with us. And like, we now like have given these, these people now, like this is their full-time job. We're paying them money to do this. And so this is kind of like, the, I would say the ethos of like web three, like really in practice, yes. right? like, like random, like people, not random, but like in some ways, random people from around the world connecting and then saying, Hey, we're excited about this thing too. Like, let's work together. Let's make this like dream a reality. And so uh, we have like them, we have like some game develop. We have two game developers just uh, hired this UI designer. And then we have uh, like four 3d artists working right now. So like a lot of people trying to make this thing real. Uh, most of these people I have not met in real life. Uh, and so that, that's again, amazing. The new world we live in. Um, yeah. I, I, so the, the team is bigger. They're, they're working hard. I imagine that discord is going to be a big hiring funnel for us moving forward because we've kind of seen like a more natural progression in like work. It now seems is like, why not you uh, something you're passionate about, you're excited about that you do for fun you why not like slowly contribute more and more to that until that becomes your job like why does the job market have to be that after i graduate college i go apply to these like random companies that i don't really know what they do and like then okay i have to learn about their context wouldn't it actually be more efficient for everyone if kind of like the things you're already excited about you're able to contribute to and then over time you basically can like earn a money and like earn a living doing that i feel like that's going to be the future model of, of employment and um it's it's like a win-win for everybody right because for the employer, your people who are passionate about what they do are going to perform better, right? Like they care more, they know what the users want, they're gonna try harder. There's the and so I don't I don't think there's like that much dis, uh, difference, honestly, in, in terms of talent between different people. I think it's mainly like what is your passion, what is your drive? And so I kind of think like if you put one person in one circumstance that they don't care about, they'll seem dumb. And one person in a circumstance that they really care about, they'll seem like extremely smart. And that's mainly in my opinion, just because they're able to like have a lot of passion and spend time on what they care about and like, and learn how to be an expert in this domain. And so, uh, yeah, I, that's, I think that's just super interesting. And I'm excited to see like our team grow from our discord community and like other, other communities kind of foster the same energy. Yeah, that's, that's actually a perfect answer. Um, and we are coming up on top of the hour. So I want to get I want to make sure that people can find you. Where can where can others find you about your project, about you? Um, kind of what would be your next steps uh, for somebody listening who wants to learn more? Um, I would say you can go to our, our, our Twitter or our Discord. Our Twitter is probably the easiest thing. It's just at Project Fives. So Fives, F-I-V-E-S. Uh, um, and the reason, if anyone's wondering what that name is, uh, some people have asked. Basically, when you play pickup basketball in real life, you'll be like, hey, let's play fives if you want to play like a full game. Um, so it's kind of like a basketball slang term. But so yeah, on Twitter, we're at Project Fives. And then um, there should, there's on like a link tree to our Discord. You should join the Discord. That's like where most of like the active chatter, the leaks come out. Uh, my personal is just at Summy the Great. And then I, Tristan's is uh, at ETH underscore Tristan. But yeah, I would say the most one relevant one is to go to, our, go to the Project Fives. You can find everyone else's after that. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. I'm really excited about this. I, I didn't know that that's um, because now I'm looking through I was looking through your Twitter uh, yesterday and today and looking at the the 3D renders that you guys are are putting out. Um, I mean, those are sharp. <laughs> those are really sharp. And I could really see uh, some significant uh, riffs on on this. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, we have. So we've like studied the NFT scene a lot and I genuinely believe we're making the most sophisticated and most um, and the best looking like, NFT with this baller collection we're going to drop. And so our original NFT was obviously like very rudimentary. And so I think some people think like that's the whole thing. It's going to be like a text-based game. Uh, yeah. No, we've got, we've kind of been in the, in the cave grinding on making these 3d models. And so like, like our baller collection is what's going to launch next month, which is those, again, those are like the characters you actually use in game that you can customize. Mm -hmm. And so those are going to be very unique for NFT projects that I know, because it's a fully 3d model. That's also fully rigged. That's also an in-game character. And so I'm sure you've, you've seen a bunch of NFT projects. There's like some now that are starting to do 3d models, but they don't obviously don't have a game like uh, with it. They don't have a rigged model. It's just kind of like a 3d asset. 
And then there's mm -hmm. like the most notable projects are kind of these like 2D layered profile picture projects. And so that's why I feel like we're actually truly innovating and making something new here is that like, hey, these are actually 3D models in game characters that, that can be used. And so, and they're gonna be, also you can, you can customize them on chain, right? Like when you equip like a new item, they will, their on-chain appearance will actually change. So your, your profile picture could change. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm super excited about the baller launch. I think anyone who's like tuning in or learning about the project now, uh, that's kind of like the thing to watch next month when we launch those ballers. That's when I think people are really going to start to get excited about what we're doing. And when does, when does it launch next month? Uh, yeah, middle, I don't, we don't have an exact date right now. We're aiming for like around March 15th, but uh, okay. that's not the locked in date, but around then. So right around March Madness, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Smart move. Um, Strategic right. timing, perhaps. Yeah, convenient. Uh, how much, how much are they going to be? Uh, so that depends on how many um, you actually, so our, our, the way that our game works is that you have DNA packs to create a baller. And so a DNA pack is kind of like a set of stats that will influence what your baller will be like. So for example, you might have like a DNA pack that's like for a three point shooter. And so then your created baller will be better at three point shooting and they might get some certain cosmetics on their character based on that. And so the reason I bring that up is because uh, people in our community basically hold various numbers of DNA packs. Some people own just one, some people own like 50, some people own hundred. Mm -hmm. And so um, to incentivize, like, again, we, we want, we like to do things that align ourselves with our community that align ourselves with like our supporters for people who have more DNA packs, you get uh, more ballers that you can mint freely. Uh, the base price, if you just were to buy just one DNA pack, if you want to were to mint one baller, it's 0.12345E. Okay. Gotcha. Awesome, man. Hey, Sami, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to see where the Fives NFT project ends up. Um, you're really making some trailblazing efforts inside of this NFT play to earn space. And I'm, I'm really excited that, that you guys were able to come on the show here today and uh, share with our listeners, because I think play to earn, just as you said, it is the future of gaming. Um, and, and I really truly believe that. So I'm excited that we met and uh, I can't wait to see where you end up. Thank you so much for sticking here until the very, very end. If you wouldn't mind just leaving a comment or subscribing or liking the podcast or wherever you downloaded this, maybe it was from YouTube, um, I would love for that. You take an extra couple seconds to give us some more love. Even though you have listened here to the very, very end, we appreciate that so much. Could you also go over to thestarspodcast.com if you found any of this uh, really interesting and you wanted to dive in a little bit further? Or go to our Discord, which is Rosinante Studios NFT. Enjoy the journey. And be sure to check out our Twitter Spaces Tuesday Live Crew at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. Free NFTs and Poe apps.